This is Twit. Okay, so this attack, I do need to stress the word potential. So far, it has not been found in the wild. It is a bunch of researchers demonstrating a weakness in the Bluetooth wireless standard that could allow hackers to intercept keystrokes, address books, and other sensitive data sent from billions of devices. So this whole thing is called, the process that's vulnerable is called Key Negotiation of Bluetooth, or NOB for short. The attack forces two or more devices to choose an encryption key just a single byte in length before establishing a Bluetooth connection. Attackers within radio range can then use commodity hardware to quickly crack the key. From there, attackers can use the crack key to decrypt data passing between the devices. The types of data susceptible could include keystrokes passing between a wireless keyboard and computer, address books uploaded from a phone or car dashboard, or photographs exchanged between phones. Knob does not require an attacker to have any previously shared secret material or to observe the pairing process of the targeted devices, which is how the WEP and some of the um, Wi-Fi uh, encryption standards were broken. This exploit is invisible to Bluetooth apps and the operating systems they run on, making the attack almost impossible to detect without highly specialized equipment. Knob also exploits a weakness in the Bluetooth standard itself. That means in all likelihood that the vulnerability affects just about every device that's compliant with the specification. The researchers have simulated the attack on 14 different Bluetooth chips, including those from Broadcom, Apple, and Qualcomm, and found all of them to be vulnerable. So highlighted in the article, it says, quote, the key negotiation of Bluetooth, knob attack, exploits a vulnerability at the architectural level of Bluetooth. The researchers wrote in a research paper published just this week. The vulnerable encryption key negotiation protocol endangers potentially all standard compliant Bluetooth devices, regardless of their Bluetooth version number and implementation details. We believe that the encryption key negotiation protocol has to be fixed as soon as possible. So anyway, while the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, the SIG, the body that oversees the wireless standard, um, works to provide a fix, a handful of companies have released software updates that patch or mitigate the vulnerability, which is tracked as CVE-2019-9506. Those with fixes include Microsoft Windows, Yay Lou, Apple Mac OS, iOS, and Watch OS, <coughs> Google for Android, Cisco IP phones and the WebEx um, system, and BlackBerry-powered Android phones. The U.S. CERT has issued this advisory. The Bluetooth Special Interest Group, meanwhile, posted a security notice, and I'm going to read it. It's headline, Glaring Weaknesses. The attack targets glaring weaknesses in the key setup process that occurs just prior to two devices connecting. The Bluetooth specification allows keys to have lengths of as many as 16 bytes or as few as one byte. The lower limit, the researcher said, was put in place in part to comply with international encryption regulations. The result, all Bluetooth compliant devices are required to negotiate the length of the key they will use to encrypt the connection. A master device may start out proposing a 16-byte key, and the slave device may respond that it's only capable of using a one-byte key. With that, the key will be downgraded to a size that's trivial to crack using brute force techniques, which attempt to guess every possible combination until the correct one is found. As if that wasn't bad enough, this key length negotiation, which occurs over something known as the link manager protocol, <laughs> isn't encrypted or authenticated. The negotiation is also completely opaque to apps and OSs. As a result, the key encrypting the keystrokes and other sensitive data may be protected by a trivially, cra trivially cracked one-byte key with no easy way for a user to even know. So we need to thank the researchers, Danielle Antonelli, Antionelli of Singapore University of Technology and Design, Nils Ole Tiphauer of CIS CISPA Helmholtz Center for Information Security, pardon me, 
and Casper B. Rasmussen with the University of Oxford have devised two attack variants to exploit these weaknesses. The first is a remote technique in which the attacker uses a custom Bluetooth device to perform an active man-in-the-middle attack on the two connecting devices. The researchers call these devices Alice and Bob. The goal of the man-in-middle attack caused the devices to agree on a one-byte key, as noted. Anyway, we can go on and on and on. <clears throat> but the reality is, is Bluetooth, when I went to some of the original SIG meetings, had lofty pie-in-the-sky um, goals. And Ericsson, who was a big um, uh, pusher behind this uh, whole thing, uh, was bragging about how secure the encryption was. Unfortunately, it sounds like someone, somewhere, in some sort of government institution managed to go and say, no, you've got to have it less. So my comment is, gee, didn't the Bluetooth folks learn from mistakes made in the Wi-Fi world? And are we making this too easy? So, Kurt, <clears throat> let's toss this first to you and say, does this give you the willies? <laughs> Is this going to be a problem in the enterprise? Well, I certainly think it could be a problem in the enterprise. Um, the The real issue, though, is that this is one of those things that's uh, reminiscent of what we've seen in everything from Spectre and Meltdown to some of the BGP uh, exploits. This is an issue in the basic protocol. Um, that means that it's not really, you know, easily patched. What you're having to do is patch around the protocol rather than doing something to, to fix a problem that, that happened as the, the protocol was implemented. And I, I think it's worth noting that the real weakness here, the one byte key, uh, came about because some governments required that uh, as part of um, meeting their regulations on strong encryption. And the reason I say it's worth noting that is because we have people in our government right now who are eager to force companies to put back doors, otherwise known as intentional vulnerabilities, in their encryption schemes for law enforcement purposes. Once you do that, it's going to ultimately be exploited, no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, this is a good example of that uh, and a warning for future regulators pretty much everywhere. So I think let's toss this next comment to uh, Lou. And uh, so, Mr. Maresca. Just how hard is it nowadays? We, we used to be sensitive about encryption. We needed to go and you know have encryption processors and all this. But from a programmer standpoint, one byte versus 16 bytes, it's not very different as far as the, from a programmer standpoint anymore, is it? You know, we have such scalable storage nowadays, it really isn't. I mean, um, you know, a lot of organizations, they pay very specific attention to that when it comes to sharding their databases or scaling their databases out uh, or their storage. But most of the time nowadays, uh, which is actually a really good thing to do, is to store your data in a separate place, a uh, separate location. Um, and so you usually have different quotas and things for that. And when you're talking about localized applications, yeah, it's so easy to do nowadays with Bcrypt and other kind of libraries that support it. There's no reason why it shouldn't be done out of the box when you're building a new application or even when you're upgrading its solutions. So, like, I, I don't see that there's a really excuse here other than the fact that they're paying more attention to, to innovation uh, and the technology behind it than they really worried about adding adding the layer. Now, the adding a layer of complexity because I really think that security uh, and encryption does add a layer of complexity to things and can sometimes slow down innovation. But in the same sense, it should be interweaved into the into the design and development and implementation process. So I, I don't necessarily think it's a really good excuse, 
Uh, but these things happen, and you're, we're starting to see that a lot with IoT devices. And now we're even seeing it with uh, even lower level components like Bluetooth. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that really occurs to me is that we've got, you know, every sorry Tom, Dick, and Harriet. Let let's be even here. Um, use almost everybody on Earth uses Bluetooth devices now um, to varying levels of success. And I think one of the reasons why is they've become more and more and more easy to set up. Have we gone too far? You know, should we be having um, things like QR codes for, you know, strong encryption keys that are unique to the device or something like that, you know, so that we can do the setups in a more secure manner? Um, maybe an RFID, tap and go or QR code. This... This is more, I think, well, one, politics. Two, I think maybe we're also crippling these devices by making them too easy to set up. Anyone want to take a comment on that? Well, I think, go ahead, go ahead, Kurt. No, you, you go, Lou. You, you pro probably have something more intelligent than I to say. <laughs> I doubt it. I, I, all I was going to say is, is that... I think it, these things are kind of readily available on some other platforms, and I think politics does come into effect. I think also um, sometimes the you know organizations they they start at the minimal side, you know they they started what the the least thing they could possibly do in order to get to market or to ship something uh, before they go and say okay now it's time to us to pay more attention to these other things. It's it's more it's less of a horizontal and it's more considered a vertical, and I think. That's where that the, the issue resides. I think it they need to pay more attention up front, spend more time, spend more money on it up front, and then we have we'll have less of these problems kind of leaking out and spreading the web. But um, that would be my only comment there. Kurt, you had a comment. Sure. Yeah, I think this is one of those things. You know, Brian, you were talking about the, making it a little bit more difficult, maybe putting in a couple of additional steps for authenticating Bluetooth devices to one another. Um, what this all comes down to, you know, user interface issues and what we like to call uh, friction differential when it comes to, uh, to security. Basically, you want to make it as difficult as possible for criminals to interrupt the signal, interrupt the, the transmission, and as easy as possible for legitimate users to do so. And what designers have done consistently is is go strongly toward making the the interaction for the the end user as close to invisible as possible. And unfortunately, that invisibility uh, has also provided a a cloak of invisibility to the attackers. Um, you know when the attacker understands the system, better than the people who are designing the applications, that's when you end up with real problems. And that's what we see time after time after time. Well, there, we're just going to have to learn our lessons. You know, obviously, the folks in the Wi-Fi Alliance have learned it with WEP and then the, the original WPA. Well, maybe we're going to have to start having yet another Bluetooth standard that fixes this, and hopefully it gets pushed through quickly.